Hi, everybody. This is Dr. Vonda Wright. Thank you so much for joining us again for our Women's Health Conversations Smart Savvy Speaker Series. And I'm in my office today and not uh, the Women's Health Conversations studio. So today we have a really exciting program because we are having Leslie Bonsey, who is sports nutritionist to the stars, coming to talk to us about active eating advice. So stay tuned and we'll be right back with Leslie Bonsey. Hi everybody, it's Dr. Vonda Wright. We are so glad to have you back on Women's Health Conversations uh, speaker series. And I am joined again today for this live recording uh, to which you can submit questions. I'm joined first of all, as you've seen before, uh, by Denise Louie. She is co-producing this with me. But very excited today to have Leslie Bonsey with us. Now, Leslie and I have also <laughs> known each other for a big period of our careers. Leslie is a sports nutritionist a visionary, a media expert, and has most recently taken care of the Kansas City Chiefs. Woo, Jesse, Hi. congratulations. Thank and you. Also historically the Pittsburgh Penguins, the Pittsburgh Steelers. So we're all really excited to have her here today. So Leslie, we're just gonna launch in. With and I'm going to go silent okay, so that and remember you. everybody you can post questions and we'll be teeing them up toward the end. That's great. So we'll wait for Denise to go muted and then we're going to have uh, Leslie and I talking. So Leslie, um, you have a brand new venture in the last year or so called Active Eating Advice. And what one of the many things I have learned from you over the years, because frankly, every time I talk to you, I learned something amazing. And after this, for people who are listening, I am going to um, post some of the videos you and I have made before. We made four Perfect. videos for runners that we used with the Pittsburgh races. So I will post those on Women's Health Conversations and on my own pages. Um, but one of the things that I've learned from you in the years is that I'm confused about food. But yes. But because I'm going to always turn to you, because I honestly try to stay in my own lane. I don't always stay in my own lane, but I try. Because once I venture out of my own lane, which is really mobility, I learn how much I don't know. But one of the really important things you taught me recently, and you may not even know this, is that food is confusing and I need to stop with the language that I was using about less. Eat, do less of this, do less of that. Because you are so right when you said to me, Vonda, you really need to be thinking about more. Not penalizing people for food, but encouraging them to do more of the right thing. So talk to me about that mindset, because so much of health is mindset. And then what it means to you to eat more, do more. Well, absolutely. And I think we really are a nation of foodies instead of foodies. And that doesn't mean that everybody's going to be a five-star chef. But what it does mean is that all of the self-blame and all the beating up and all of that, it doesn't help. It doesn't help people to take care of themselves optimally to be the best they can. And oftentimes the message of less, 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 it doesn't resonate. And we say less, less, less that many more times. And it's, oh, I need more cheesecake. I need more this. I need more that. <laughs> to make so, up for and, it. To reward yeah, ourselves. Yeah. And, and the reality is that when we look at what the shortfall nutrients are in the majority of people in this country, you know, we could correct that by making sure we have enough, optimizing the amount of certain things that we take in every day. That means we can be selective but we don't want to be neglectful. And I think it's just such a more positive message. Are you optimizing your plate or your bowl or your glass every single time you eat? That's something that resonates no matter what age we are. And we usually feel we can buy into that concept if we think about it that way. I love the thought of optimizing. And that's the language I use when I talk about mobility and optimizing all phases of our performance. So because there's this weird dichotomy with food, Leslie. There's the food is pleasure, and therefore lots of people get in trouble sometimes with the reward eating. But then there's that other side that, you know, we're being penalized, the less, less, less conversation. So how do we uh, 
pivot the conversation to more optimize without getting in the trouble zone what does optimize really mean for a, a lay person like me yeah so and and i think especially right now where so, so many people are feeling stressed and uncertain and worried and fearful and looking for comfort wherever they can mm -hmm. find it and mm -hmm. i do think that we can derive comfort from our eating plan but comfort is making sure we have the array of what we need and an amount that makes sense to us and also sitting down, nurturing, savoring. Mm -hmm. And right now, for a lot of people, we have time to do that. We don't have to do the drive-by shovel with food. That's right. We can actually sit. Exactly. Yeah. So that is part of it. And then also the, what do I feel as a result of what I've eaten? Do I have more energy? Can mm. I run up and down the stairs chasing a three-year-old? Do oh. I have the energy to lift weights or to do whatever or simply feel good and feel vibrant and feel uh -huh. fresh? Or am I just exhausted all the time? Because if the answer is the latter, then there's mm -hmm. something wrong with what we're eating. We may not be having enough of certain things in order to make ourselves feel the best we possibly can. So go back with me and because we probably have people listening that really have done a lot of reading they maybe they've listened to you already and other people are like i don't know what the heck so you know you've gotten so granular for me where when you bring props to the meetings you speak for me at you've got these props and you're like vaughn a piece of meat should be no bigger than the this much of your hand and just go over what is what is enough of each food group on a plate because we're not doing pyramids anymore we're doing plates and and uh, help me with that. Yes. So, and, and first of all, I always clarify: it's a plate, not a tray or a platter. So that oh, we're, you know, it's all not thinking a platter. about it. plate. <laughs> That's the plate. So, and then when we look at that plate, and really for all of us to optimize our health is for the protein part of the plate. I would say ideally size of hand. And in general, women have smaller hands than men do anyway. Now, mm -hmm. whether that is going to come from an animal-based protein, if that is poultry, if that is a lean red meat, if that is, is uh, fish, or if it's a plant-based protein, a veggie burger, tofu, something like that. Mm -hmm. Then we look at two fifths of the plate being produce. So that could be all vegetable, that could be a combination of vegetable and fruit. Not only is it the color, but it's the fill factor. It takes up a lot of real estate in the gut to make us feel fuller. And yeah. then about one fifth of the plate of whatever one's choosing to do as that carb. Is mm -hmm. it a rice, quinoa, fado, pasta, spelt? You know, the list is mm -hmm. endless there, but it's not a trough of pasta. It is not an entire box of rice. It is not a potato yeah. the size of a canoe. So thinking about <laughs> the majority of the plate is going to be protein produce with uh -huh. some other carbohydrate on the plate, and then probably a thumb or two of fat, depending upon what our calorie needs are. So that is not the entire avocado, nor is it the entire jar of peanut butter, mm -hmm. but it's really hard sometimes to eat things totally dry. And that little bit of oil just brings the flavor and the savor and the enjoyment. And then mm -hmm. we walk away from that meal feeling satisfied instead of, oh my God, I better raid the cabinets because I didn't get what I needed. So do you suggest for the, and I love, I've never heard you say thumb before, but that makes total sense. The thumbs of fat. So is that something that we should add at the end? Just because so many chefs say drizzle the olive oil at the end, or is that something we should cook into our produce is what do you it, suggest? You know, it really depends upon how stingy or how not we are with the drizzle. Is, oh, my drizzle oh. was a bottle. That might be a problem. Yeah. So, for instance, if I'm roasting vegetable, I'll mm -hmm. do it ahead of time because then they get a chance to absorb that beautiful flavor and they don't need anything on the back end. But mm -hmm. we don't cook a salad. So in that case, we're probably going to be adding it on the end. Or if somebody says, I'm going to stir fry some vegetables, that little bit of oil is enough to keep them from sticking. And now I have asparagus. I can't get off the pan. The oil can help in that regard. You know, even if somebody says, I want to use nuts at a meal. So a little bit of nuts that might be slightly roasted mm. on that salad provide the crunch and that beautiful aroma okay. and flavor. And we're not using too many of them. They really are a top off. So it's not mm. drowning. It's like, oh, I can't see my lettuce underneath the ranch dressing. That is a concern. So, you know, you brought up dressing and, and uh, I do like it, but I'm going to say less, not more, but um, I'm always worried with the soup salad, not meaning not soup and salad, that you've got this gorgeous pile of produce. And sometimes I see, and I've tried to get a right way of this, putting so much 
condiment on top that you could, sh and then I see people shake it and it turns out to be kind of soupy. And I feel like that's probably not optimized if we're really- no, it isn't. About it and I mean, frankly, we do oil and vinegar because that's what we like. And there's so many gorgeous flavored vinegars right now. And yeah. it's really the liquid that is helping to moisten that salad. So mm -hmm. what somebody could do is even on a salad is put a little bit of vinegar to moisten and then you'll actually get away with using less dressing because oh. now you have the vinegar can help to coat that dressing through instead of, oh no, what's that pond in the bottom of my lettuce, <laughs> which typically right. happens otherwise. <laughs> That's right. Now I have a question about the, the hand of, um, of carbs. Now, yes. um, ma, I'm Asian and my mother makes the best white rice I can ever, and I mean, I could just eat bowls of it, not little bowls. But I'm wondering if we're going to optimize, should our handful of carbs be, besides pasta, right? We don't want whole bowls of it, but should it be high in fiber to get that extra oomph? Like, are you going to eat I don't know. I don't know. Brown rice, wheat this, wheat that. What is your advice on, do we just need to be concerned about fiber and carbs in the same handful? Not necessarily because mm. certainly the fruit and vegetable are going to provide oh, fiber as well. That's and right. Depending upon what somebody picks as their protein source, some of the plant-based veggie burgers, et cetera, do have some fiber in them. Mm -hmm. The other thing about this is people might not know that if we look at the amount of fiber in an equal serving of rice versus brown rice, it's only one gram different. It's not oh, significantly that's a myth. different. Yeah. Oh and my gosh. Yeah. So, and even if somebody says a white potato versus sweet potato, it's the same amount of fiber. It's okay. just that one is orange yellow in the middle. But you'd eat the skin because that's part of the fiber too. Some oh. people like whole wheat pasta. Some people prefer a good old semolina pasta, yeah. but how could I increase the fiber there? I could take that pasta. I could do a spaghetti sauce. I could puree cannellini beans into it. And now I've added the fiber and I've added more vegetable to that plate as well. Right. Well, that that's great for optimizing this plate and, and really knowing sizes because we're in a country where, and honestly, size of plate, I mean, you made the joke about platters, but when we moved from Pittsburgh to Atlanta, uh, I got rid of my old beat up dishes I'd had for about 20 years. And I, and I went and got some new, just plain white plates. I had a choice. Not, it's not a choice for everybody, but we had these big 12 inch dinner plates before. I purposely bought little nine inch so we are constrained by the type of plate we have and it helps us feel better after a meal because you know i was raised like so many people in a clean your plate generation right and so if i have a 12 inch plate versus i made this decision for my family they did not have a part in it so i mean i think that's a sneaky little trick that i've done uh but it helps us optimize anyway well and it does and for all of us we eat what's in front of us and it is and for most people saying only eat half yeah right that doesn't work and magically <laughs> that fork finds its way into the, the other rest half. of what's there right but yeah. and it's the same thing about do we serve family style or not that might be a lovely concept but the problem with that is is it's mm -hmm. just too easy quick proximity to more food what i would say if people really feel they want to do that put the vegetables on the table family style make that the thing that somebody oh. can reach for more and everything else stays in the kitchen so you physically have to get up from the chair and assess mm -hmm. whether or not you want more got it well i want to transition a little bit because um i want to talk about whether or not i'm pausing because i'm thinking to myself i really have known you a wonderful amount of time and i think about the way i ate when i first knew you and the transitions of aging I've gone through since I've known you and what I have to do now, because I'm happy to share with this audience, I talk about it all the time. I've gone through menopause and it's different for me now. You know, it's very different. And so I'm wondering if you, and yet on the other side, we have a lot of women's health conversations, uh, participants who, who are still millennials. I mean, we really go from 25 to 60 and beyond on our scope here. So I wonder if there's, a generational considerations that you can give us not generations decade considerations and b what the heck leslie happens to my ability to eat food after menopause i mean please rescue me because it's not the same right it is not the same and you know and one of the things is we look at 
early on, those are the formative years. Those are the preventative years of is somebody doing the maximum they can for their body to guarantee or to optimize their muscle and bone strength as they get older. We don't want to be reactive. Uh-oh, now I'm 50, let's think about it. What is somebody doing in their 20s and 30s? Are they including those antioxidant-containing foods in fruits and vegetables? Are they making sure that it's not just protein at one meal of the day, like the Nike swoosh, is their protein as part of every single meal? So we're really setting the stage and foundation to help our body be as healthy as it can possibly be. Now, right. as we transition transition to more uh, the 30s, 40s, then yeah, sometimes the body is not as efficient at using the calorie. That doesn't mean everything off the plate. It means, first of all, to your point, have we changed the size of the plate? Maybe it is a little smaller plate, so we really put some boundaries around what it is that we are eating. Uh, are we taking the time to eat instead of like, I got to eat in five minutes. Am I taking that 15, 20 minutes to chew and savor? Am I incorporating it? And I love this concept, foods that have liquid in them, not just liquids with a meal, but foods with liquid in them. That's what produce does. That's what soup does. That's stew or chili because it actually takes up more room in the gut and you feel fuller for longer. As we're in our 30s and 40s, also being preventative regarding hyperlipidemia, hypertension, uh, uh, helping our blood glucose to remain where it should be. So really thinking about that. Do I have enough fiber? Am I eating good fats as part of what I do? And then, yes, after menopause. I went through an early menopause and you know, I'm, I'm like as old as a fossil right now. But what I do think makes a very big, big, big difference is number one is, you you know, really thinking about the plate and for me is I like my plate being at least the hand of the protein that's critically important as part of every meal is I actually a little bit more on the produce for me uh, mm -hmm. that works and then it's a little bit less it's not no carb on the plate but it's a little bit less so I kind of change that focus of the plate so one quarter of the plate is carb about uh, one half of the plate is going to be uh, the produce and then one third is protein that I find has been a recipe for success also thinking about that size of the plate overall mm -hmm. makes a really big difference and even being mindful you know I, I don't think everything has to be tiny portions but I really think there's a problem with buying in bulk, right? So if I buy nuts in bulk, a handful, come on, what does that mean? Everybody has a different size hand. It's, no, no, no. So either it's already portioned or the little quarter cup measuring cup is uh -huh. there in the nuts. So that's easier to think yeah. about what we're doing. It's not just unconscious eating. We're really making, being mindful about what it is that we do. And I found that to be extremely helpful. And then certainly, and I know you would agree with me very strongly on this, is get up and move your ass. That really helps as well. That's you know, and not just not just the moving, but the, the strength right. training. That's become much more a part of my life, which really helped when you're trying to throw a three-year-old into the air right now. <laughs> but it makes all the difference in the world of kind of keeping everything where I want it to be and not having the wigglies and the jigglies. That helps. <laughs> Absolutely. And um, something that I've struggled with and, um, and made the adjustments as you've suggested is not to totally stop carbs, but but to to make it a less vibrant part of my life, frankly, because I don't train the way I used to. You know, mm -hmm. I'd love to. I've signed up for a couple of marathons this year, but but uh, I used to run like a like a fiend, and I don't need that that instant energy I used to. And I think that's what we forget in what you've just said is we've got to be more mindful that we're just you know how you drive home sometimes and you don't even really know how you got there because first you were at work and now you're in your driveway. I think that's the way we eat sometimes. We don't even really know what we just did. It's just gone. Right. And that's and everybody, because everybody's eyes are everywhere, but on their plate. And it's probably one of the best lessons learned from what other countries of the world do where, where people used to live in a world where you could go out to eat. Maybe we'll get back to that at some point in time, but you actually take the time to eat and eating is not a 10 minute uh, shove. It is an hour or an hour and a half. So you're using utensils and you're sitting and you're eating and you're enjoying. And it, but, but it really makes a difference overall in terms of being in the moment and then not feeling like we have to make an immediate run into the pantry cupboard because, oh, I must have missed something. Now I'll eat some more. That's it. So you know what, Leslie, so, uh, you've written a lot of books in the past and, and you know, you've advised a lot of celebrities, a lot of just 
plain people like me, but you have this new venture. You have a new website. It's called Active Eating Advice, mm -hmm. and you're posting all over Instagram and Facebook. Tell me about this new venture and how you're packaging your ideas these days. What are you doing? Yeah, well, a lot of different things. And because uh, right now the NFL is on hold, mm -hmm. uh, the XFL is back. So, you know, there's certain things that I'm going to be reforming what it is that I do, but it, the way that we're learning is also different right now. And there's yeah. a lot more virtual learning going on. And so I am having a ball with this, this series of videos that I would call wealth on the shelf of what you already have at home with things that you can combine in ways that are manageable and doable, because there's a lot of people that are culinary challenged. They never <laughs> cooked before. They never <laughs> thought about it. They're like, oh my God, what do I do now? So, you know, trying to do that with my crazy humor. I mean, that's one of the things that I'm doing. I've had uh, two book ideas that are up here that are now, mm -hmm. now that I'll say this to you, it kind of forces the issue along of that's doing it. Totally. Um, the, one, uh, the one is going to be called If Your Thighs Could Talk. And oh. yeah, so a kind of like a little tongue in cheek about how we look at our bodies and what our bodies do for us with you know, a lot of my crazy humor because it needs to be there. I love um, it. The, the other one from Our Hearts to Their Bowls uh, that will be a collaborative effort of all of my colleagues that are registered dietitians and glam mothers and the things that we do for our own bodies and how we uh, take that and pass that message on to the little ones. And then I think maybe the other one will be how do you take care of a three-year-old when you were old? So I mean, oh. that's, that's kind of where they're right now with that. <laughs> but but those things are, are are a lot of fun. So really trying to transition to more visual learning. Um, mm -hmm. I actually have a ballroom dancer I work with who lives in Montreal. So it's been so much fun. You know, at some point I'd love to go and see her perform. Uh, to doing some collaborative efforts with chefs. Uh, you know how we can split screen and do some things and do a little toss. Yeah. back and forth because food is providing comfort to people right now. I just had a wonderful opportunity of working with a colleague of mine who, it, who runs a food bank in Northeastern Pennsylvania and putting together a recipe book for her of mm -hmm. food uh, items that could be given to guests of the pantry. So you know, at right now it, it's kind of the give back and give on, doing some mentoring as well. So my fingers are in every single pod right now. It's the way that it's always been, but now it's a little bit more FaceTime instead of embrace time. And that's okay. <laughs> that's good. I love the sound of those projects. And, and I have actually, the, those videos you're doing about what's on the pantry. And you know what the first one I saw, I was so impressed because if for those of you who haven't seen it, you need to go find uh, Leslie on Instagram and Facebook and go see these videos. But you're standing behind the array of foods, and it really does look like you went to your pantry and say, I'll take one of this and one of this, and then you made something of it. I mean, because I'm in the same boat. I've got this pantry. I, I don't plan that well when I go to the grocery store. I'm like, I don't know. I'll take a little of this. But I loved how you put all the ideas together. Well, oh. and you know, right now, we don't want people going to the grocery store that often. Yeah. So, you know, we're kind of doing the inventory of what you already have around, yeah. which number one, saves you money. And number two, yeah. it prevents that waste because it's like, who needs 10 bottles of oregano? Nobody. So, you know, kind of doing a little bit of that effort on the front end, then yeah. you get the value added and maybe it's new skills. And I would really encourage anybody listening, watching is if you have kids, this is a perfect time to get them into the kitchen. It is active movement in the kitchen. You can learn a lot of skills in there and then you have a sous chef already. So you don't have to be the you chef all the time. That's perfect. So I'm going to ask Denise uh, Cylon Louis to come back on and see if we have any questions or things that Denise you want to talk about. Denise is not only a Leslie. Denise has a very interesting background. I've known her since she was a CPA, a consultant, and now she works for Smuckers as their their uh, their crypto person. Like if you want cybersecurity, <laughs> Denise is the person to know. But also she has raised three children, so. Do you have questions for us, Denise? Has anything uh, wrong true with yes. you? Yes, actually. Well, you know, we had a couple questions that got teed up here. So it was a great segue, actually, because you talked about your pantry. And so, like, what are the three things, say, that are always in your pantry, like you could never do without as a nutritionist? Okay. So number one, it's always beans. Um, so it could be a, a, you know, an equal opportunity bean. So that could be a garbanzo, a cannellini. Uh, it could be a, a kidney bean. It could be a black bean. That's always there in our pantry. Um, in the pantry as well, always 
oatmeal. It's always there because it can be so incredibly versatile. Mm -hmm. So if we're looking for the shelf stable thing, um, the other thing I would say is there is pumpkin and, and tomatoes, yes. I would add that's four. So pumpkin. the reason for that is that canned pumpkin is it's so high in beta carotene and it doesn't have a lot of flavor that makes it a wonderful add into a soup to a stew to an oatmeal and you add some vegetable and right now in western pennsylvania fresh tomatoes i don't think so but the canned tomatoes work really really well in lots of different ways yeah oh wow that is that is great um so what is your latest uh like food um you know, favorite, you know, some, cause I work in the food industry. And so we hear a lot about, you know, uh, different flavors, different, um, spices that might be used, you know, kind of like what's on trend. So from a nutritionist standpoint, what is your like favorite thing that's come out? Yeah, I, I, I really love savory. I mean, that's my thing. So, um, and I, I really like that juxtaposition of flavors. So, you know, here's one that, that we make. It's a Brussels sprout with a little bit of chopped prunes and harissa. It's absolutely wonderful combination of the spicy with that little bit of sweet with a little bit of the bitter of the Brussels sprout. You got it all going on. Have a little vodka. Oh, wow. You can make it a martini. All wow. good. A vegetable teeny. <laughs> there we go. I like her. <laughs> I know. I'm sorry, but Leslie, I'm sorry that I don't know this and anybody else that thinks I'm smart out there. What's Harissa? Oh, oh, yeah. Thank a, you. I'm glad like, you know, asked that question. I know. I was like, mm, Harissa, mental yeah, note. It it's like it, it's a, a Middle Eastern spice, and it's really this this wonderful blend. It kind of it's a little peppery, uh, it's a little bit zesty, and you can buy it that way. You can buy it as a powder, or you can buy it as a paste. I buy it as a powder because I find that a lot more versatile. But in any spice aisle in the grocery store right now, you'll see it. H a r i s s a. Very okay. very good. Perfect. Thanks for clearing that up. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. All right. So this next one, this is going to be fun. This is like rapid fire. Okay. Um, all right. So it's like your favorite, this, that, or the other. All right. You ready? Yep. Okay. Favorite oil. Olive. Olive. Okay. Favorite veggie. Favorite vegetable. Um, Brussels sprouts. Actually. Brussels sprouts. Yeah. Brussels sprouts mm -hmm. is having a moment, isn't it? It is. I yes. love those things. <laughs> oh, we, oh yeah. As a matter of fact, I had Brussels sprouts in Atlanta. Oh, have, I don't remember the name of the restaurant, but boy, was that good. Yeah, so good. Good, good. Okay, so you just mentioned the spice, but is that your favorite spice? What's your favorite spice? From an um, nutritional okay, so yeah, uh, favorite favorite spice. I would say probably, and it, I would I, I consider it a spice of flavoring is garlic because you know, hello, my last name ends in a vowel. There it is. So, there it is. <laughs> what can I say? <laughs> there you go. There you go. Okay, favorite um, protein. Fish, fish. Um, and, and I really specifically scallops are my favorite, um, but you know, a, a salmon, steelhead sprout, uh, steel, steelhead trout, uh, red snapper, mahi, wahoo, yes. Okay, okay. Favorite nut from a mm. nutrition standpoint? Mm. From a nutrition standpoint? standpoint well you know they're all great from from what i would say i love the most i would say it's a pecan and you know there we go that and that's not just because it's a georgia thing but you know they really are i love them <laughs> okay uh favorite kitchen gadget for making highly nutritional food oh i i would say without a doubt it's a blender and uh, i use a a ninja because it has blades that could literally amputate a hand but the good thing about that is it can cut through anything so you can make anything that my hummus uh, soup sauces smoothie any yeah. kind of thing so we really like to make soups and then puree them to give them that wonderful consistency yes they're they're fabulous okay okay great and remember if those who are participating online you can ask you can submit a question i'm going to be monitoring those here um so you had brought up in the conversation with vonda talking about nutritional shortfalls right what is you know as americans what is the biggest nutritional shortfall that we have and maybe you can think in terms of men uh women and also maybe even children yeah, so this is an equal opportunity because it is uh, both men and women and it is across the life cycle. One in 10 individuals in the United States is getting enough fruit and vegetable every day. One in 10. That means nine of us are not. So everybody has some work to do. And whether that is fresh, frozen, canned, dried, freeze-dried, 
all of those things count as produce. We think about something like a hummus, that's a bean. Think about a spaghetti sauce, that's a vegetable. All of these things work well and everybody should be doing something to color up that plate, that bowl, that glass. We would all be healthier as a result. And you know what? I probably learned this from you too. And I'm so thankful, especially now during this COVID weird time, that vegetables frozen out of the field retain their nutrients. So because the problem we have in my house is when I'm shopping and it's, it's that I hate clothes shopping, but vegetable shopping is like Nirvana for me. So I'm like doing all this and then I can't eat it in time. So thank God you told me that the, the, the spinach in the fr flash frozen or the, it's still healthy. So we can have that and not wasting and not worry about the wasting food and everything I'm throwing out on Wednesday when the garbage man comes. Which yeah. Is well, that's it. You know, preventing the food waste, it's also incredibly fast. You don't have to chop anything and whatever you don't use is going back and the freezer. So it's economical on, on all fronts. It's a time saver on all fronts. And I think especially now when people are wanting to feel as secure and safe as they can when they're shopping, when you're buying something frozen or when you're buying something in a can, then you, nobody's touching it per se. I mean, you still mm -hmm. want to wash, wash off or wipe it off when you get home, but at least it's not the same thing. If you are going to find produce, if you're going to buy fresh, uh, fruits or vegetables, do make sure that when you're ready to use them, you rinse them off well under cold running water don't give them a bubble bath don't give them a bleach bath don't do that but they do need to be rinsed off you know it's funny you would say that because my dad growing up we had a garden that my dad hand tilled and it had to be at least an acre in, in size it was enormous and now that you say it of course we like we froze all of those vegetables that's what we ate all throughout the winter, right? And so why am I not thinking in terms of the fresh produce that we're buying now to do the exact same thing with it? That is exactly. such a revelation and I can't believe you just said that. <laughs> <laughs> These are great, These are great <laughs> tips. I, this is why we're doing this. And Leslie, uh, frozen vegetables, and maybe I'm wrong, but they, they count as, as whole foods. They're not processed. They're, it's not like they're fluorescent, right? Because we, we prefer no all natural, I'm going to use the language we're trying to use, to optimize na the colors in nature, not to make up fluorescent uh, foods. But, but frozen vegetables and canned vegetables, do they count as whole food, right? Absolutely, they do. Do. They do. It, it, you know, the, the growers that are specifically growing for uh, those, those companies that's, that specialize in frozen food. So those vegetables are picked as soon as they are ripe. They are flash frozen. There it is. Or when they're being canned. It is literally from the field to the shelf within a five-hour period of time. It's Wow. Fast. So nutritionally, oh you're getting something that is absolutely equivalent and the convenience. And as I mentioned uh, already to Denise about the tomatoes, I'm not eating fresh tomatoes at this time of the year because they're horrible. But you know, the canned tomatoes, canned diced tomatoes are so incredibly versatile. They were in one of those wealth on the shelf videos for a chili because I can just open up that can and use it. And there it is. Very, very simple. And the can can be recycled. So it's good all the way around. <laughs> Okay, so we do have a uh, question here that just came in. Um, what nutritional changes can we make uh, to boost our immune systems, especially now? And, and, and I have kind of a follow-up to that. Um, you know, we, we think in terms of uh, certain foods that are good for our eyes or certain foods that are good for our hearts, but are there certain foods that are good for our lungs? And, you know, but, okay. and, you know so maybe that or but just overall. All right, excellent question. So first of all, we can't boost our immune system, we can support it. And when we support our immune system in terms of realizing is where the bulk of our immune system resides, it's actually in our digestive tract. People aren't aware of that, but that's where it is. So we wanna make sure that we're taking good care of our gut. And that means incorporating in some foods that might be sources of probiotics, right? That's yogurt, that's mm -hmm. kefir, those are good things to use. Um, even if people are eating kimchi, if they're doing a a fresh sauerkraut or a refrigerated one, those all provide those good probiotics to our gut. Making sure that we are consuming enough protein is critically important to support a healthy immune system. Making sure that we are consuming enough fluid, that is critically important. Making sure that we are incorporating foods that have vitamin C in it. 
not necessarily supplementing, but vitamin C is tomatoes, it is citrus, it is strawberries, it is kiwi, making sure that we're having foods that have zinc in them, that is seafood, it is whole grains, it is some nuts and seeds. When we look at what really helps the lung, it is primarily foods that are high in beta carotene, the foods that have the beautiful orange color to them. So mm. thinking about a papaya, thinking about a carrot, thinking about a sweet potato, uh, thinking about an orange, all of those types of things can be incredibly helpful to our body. Great. Great. Oh, that was really good. That was good. Okay. I've got one last question for you here. Um, what is the best nutritional advice you've ever gotten and what made it so wow to you? Hmm. Well, you know, actually as an undergrad, I was a biopsychology major and had no idea what I wanted to do with that. So I graduated and went to graduate school and my first class was a nutrition class and decided that was it. That's what I wanted to do with my life. And I think one of the most important things uh, to realize about nutrition is that number one, food should be enjoyment to us. And number two, that it is never one size fits all. Just as we try on a pair of shoes and realize some fit better than others, we've got to break them in, we've got to customize, we've got to realize there might be some changes along the way, but it should always be with a positive focus. What is this food doing for me without feeling bad about the foods that we are consuming? Right. Wow. I love that because food is so about more than just putting something in a pan and so... I love that. You know what? I am so thankful to see you and talk to you virtually in person. <laughs> I really miss, you know, le you, with the le energy you've seen Leslie today is how she lives. And imagine being in the same building. I was so blessed for all those years. But Leslie, thank you for your time. Welcome. I want everybody that was listening today and will be listening to this remotely um, to check out Active uh, Eating Advice. Google Leslie Bonci, B-O-N-C-I, um, and you are just a, such a trusted source, and I trust you so much that I'm always glad when you say, uh, I really am, when you say we should think more positively about our food, we should use like things like support and stop saying no, 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 but yes, food is our friend. I mean, it's as if we've been talking about a friend today, and so I'm thankful that you're here. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Everybody stay home, stay safe, stay well. Okay. Bye guys. All right. Thank you. <laughs>